Welcome everyone to this uh, sixth talk in our celebration of 65 years of GBO. I'm Emily Moravik and I'm a postdoc here at GBO. And it's been fantastic to hear about the contributions of GBO to many science areas this far. And today we are pleased to have Dr. Tom Bainio with us here today to tell us about the past and present contributions of GBO to the interesting field of radio recombination lines. Tom Bainey is a professor of astronomy at Boston University and is a founding member of its Institute for Astrophysical Research. He studies the interstellar medium of the Milky Way and other galaxies, primarily using the technique of radio spectroscopy. Dr. Bainia obtained his PhD in astronomy from the University of Virginia, and for his thesis, he made and analyzed the first large-scale map of the distribution of carbon monoxide gas in the inner region of our Milky Way galaxy, including the Galactic Center. Between his dissertation work and his current position, he's been a part of Arecibo, Cornell, and the University of Virginia. So throughout the years, uh, Tom has been a uh, part of many efforts to study radio recombination lines, and currently he's part of the GBT Diffuse Ionized Gas Survey team that's led by Lauren Anderson, and it exploits the power of the GBT Vegas spectrometer to study radio recombination emission from the diffuse gas uh, outside discrete H2 regions. So thank you so much for your time, Tom, and we're really looking forward to hearing about these contributions of GBO to radio recombination lines. Please take it away. Thank you, glad to be here. Well, uh, thank you for attending. Uh, this proves that I've been observing, this is me in the 300 foot control room 50 years ago. I've been observing on site for a very long time. And you're going to see me looking at my screen, my camera's on a tripod to the left, so I'm not crazy. If you are really going to study radio recombination lines, you need to get this book. It, it is a, a wonderful resource. The, Saga of radio recombination lines uh, started with, uh, surprisingly, uh, Vanderhall's classic 1945 paper that announced the detectability of the 21 centimeter line. He also considered uh, ionized gas and recombination lines, uh, but uh, it turned out that he made an error in his, uh, Woody Sullivan years ago looked at his papers and discovered that he had inverted an exponent at one point in his calculation, and he incorrectly concluded that pressure broadening would make the recombination lines undetectable. Kardashev uh, got it right. And so there was an international um, a, 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 a race to try to detect recombination lines. And here's one of the first published spectra of recombination lines in 1964. This was a hard experiment. It still is a hard experiment because uh, the recombination lines come from an ionized plasma. And so there's a really strong continuum um, uh, in your signal as well. So you're trying to find a weak recombination line atop a very strong continuum signal. And recombination lines are 100 times weaker or more than a 21 centimeter line. So people in 1964 looking at spectra like this were not impressed because they were used to very strong lines. Sorry about this. Why is this not working? So uh, the next year at an IAU General Assembly, the two competing Soviet groups um, presented the spectra. Um, here are the detections for uh, M17. What well, the bottom is, is uh, showing that these lines tracked the Doppler motion of the Earth's orbit about the, uh, uh, about the galactic center. And so um, people, believed these lines, and they certainly believed them the next year when during the commissioning of the 140 foot Hoagland and Metzger took these two spectra of Orion and M17. So we're looking at H2 regions in case there are some amateurs out there. H2 regions are ionized zones of gas surrounding the most massive stars that are formed, that form, and they produce uh, ionizing flux and they keep the plasma ionized and their balance between recombination, producing recombination lines, and uh, ionization keeps, uh, keeps these things um, in place, as it were, as long as these stars are shining. They are young objects. Their main sequence lifetimes are less than 10 million years of order. And so uh, they trace where stars have just formed at the present epoch. They are very bright in the radio continuum, free free Bremsstrahlen and radio recombination lines. They also emit in the infrared due to the presence of dust. In fact, 
The signature of H2 regions, it turns out, is a high radio flux and a high infrared flux. H alpha is a recombination line, the really, really bright red line in the optical. And you can see they are great tracers because of their young age of the sites of formation and they trace spiral arms. Early recombination line work, well, early H2 region work was, uh, was optical, right? And so here's a Palomar print of uh, M16. And so you're only going to be able to see things that are nearby due to interstellar extinction. The fact that recombination lines um, can be seen in the centimeter wave uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum is important because at centimeter waves, the interstellar medium in the Milky Way is optically thin for transgalactic paths. You can see that is to say H2 regions anywhere in the galaxy. And so if you want to find H2 regions and get a map of the entire galaxy, you need to look at where the continuum emission is. This is the first continuum map made in 1958, Gart Westerhouse thesis uh, in the Leiden group, that's the galactic plane. So after um, Metzger de detected the um, recombination line and Green Bank, he went and uh, joined the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn uh, and exploited the new 100 meter telescope. And they started looking at continuum bumps. This is just a Northern hemisphere map. And here is a face on map of the galaxy. There's the sun, there's the galactic center and both H2, H2. So what do you get when you detect a recombination line in the direction of an H2 region? Well, due to the Doppler shift, these things are not at the rest uh, uh, frequency of the, of the specific transition. So you get a velocity, an LSR velocity, velocity relative to the local standard of rest. And, that, and then if you know the rotation curve of the galaxy or assume one, you can, it turns out, find the distance. It's called the kinematic distance to the object. Now, kinematic distances have a problem in this first galactic quadrant because the velocity produces a double valued answer. So if you start here at the, at the Earth and march along the line of sight, going down this red line from the sun, you, you discover that there are two points along that line of sight that share the same galactocentric radius. And for axially, axisymmetric rotation curve, they share the same velocity. So an H2 region at that velocity could be either at a near distance or a far distance. And that is called the kinematic distance ambiguity. And it's beyond the scope of this talk for me to talk much more about that. But resolving this distance ambiguity and determining whether the nebula is at the near or the far distance can often be done by using H1 information and in particular, um, H1 absorption or the lack thereof or to what velocity extent it is. If you want to know more about that, see those papers. Now, I never intentionally decided to conduct radio recombination line research. I was forced into it. I was forced into it um, because I was engaged in the pursuit of one of the holy grails of radio astronomy back in my youth the 21 centimeter line, the, 20, the, the hyperfine transitions of H1, deuterium, and signally ionized helium-3 um, were goals of early radio astronomy because they were all flagged in the, in the magisterial uh, towns and shallow microwave spectroscopy text that was published before any of that, right after the H1 line was in place. So helium-3 um, was, flagged as, as something to detect, but Goldwire and Miller um, pointed out that lots more could be done with it. Um, so this is a classic paper. Bob Rood and Gary Steigman and Beatrice Tinsley um, realized that helium-3 could be a strong probe of not only um, stellar evolution, but also perhaps uh, primordial nucleosynthesis. In this paper, they decided that primordial nucleosynthesis wasn't, wasn't going to be the big deal that it turned out to be. So what's going on? Standard stellar evolution at that time produced the following scenario. Here is the PP1 chain where, that, where hydrogen is being fused into helium. And part of that chain is the production of helium-3. You can consider the, the chain as a, as, as a production and a destruction process. 
it turns out that the production reactions are sensitive to temperatures of above uh, 10 to the 5 K, but the destruction of helium-3 um, and turning it into helium-4 um, occurs at temperatures greater than 10 to the 6 K. And the reaction rates are, are sensitive to the 10 to the seventh power and 10 to the 14th power. So it's really strong. And so if a stellar core where the fusion is going on has a temperature gradient in it, which it does, the outer parts of the core don't destroy helium-3. And over the lifetime of the star, helium-3 was expected to build up in this scenario during the main sequence lifetime. And the outer part of the core, here's the mass fraction of a, of, of a solar mass star, helium-3 gets concentrated. As the star evolves off the main sequence, the con convective envelope comes in and it mixes and it enriches the outer layer of the star with helium-3. And finally, during the thermal pulsing phase going en route to a planetary nebula, helium-3 was expected to be ejected in copious quantities into the interstellar medium. And so one would expect very, one was expecting very strong helium-3 plus signals. If standard stellar evolution was correct, this would have been a two-week experiment. We're still doing it 35 years later. Here's the team involved, uh, Bob Root, Tom Wilson, at NPR, myself, Miller Goss, the guy who started it all, made us all do this, and Dana Balser. I'd like to dedicate this talk to Bob Root, my friend and my uh, colleague um, who, uh, whose passing was well too early. The problem with this experiment was detecting the line to begin with. And that is because conventional, conventional blocked aperture radio telescopes are a very bad design for this experiment because doing position switching, going on and off source, you're going from a source of extremely strong continuum emission with a tiny little recombination line on top to something with no continuum at all. And so that produces reflections between the primary and the secondary mirror, in that case of the 140 foot. And this is what you get. You get standing waves that are not pure sinusoids because of multipath uh, 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 scattering uh, off of the quadruped legs and things like that. And so what people ha had to do, what we had to do was purposely defocus the telescope, take one total power on-off pair at a focus purposely plus lambda over eight out of focus and another pair minus lambda over eight out of focus. And then when you average them together, um, you would get something that would be better, but certainly you can see that it doesn't completely remove the baseline structure. And so unfortunately, as it turns out, the residual structure is about a megahertz wide, which at 3.5 uh, centimeters is 25 kilometers a second, which is the line width of H2 regions. That is to say, the baseline structure was this of the same width as the signal that we were looking for. So here is a helium two helium three spectra for W43 and G29.9. This is how we got into the recombination line business. This is the strongest line in the band. It's H171 eta, delta N of seven. N is equal to 178 down to 171. And here's the helium three line. So we'd have to model the baseline and subtract it. And this is what we get. Now, 140 foot and all of this experiment was done with the Mark III correlator, which, which allowed us four tunings for um, 20 megahertz wide bandwidth at maximum and 256 channels. So this was very challenging. Nonetheless, um, we detected helium-3 after a lot of work in a plethora of H2 regions. And then we had to go and start doing science. A mere detection was the first holy grail. Now we want to measure the helium-3 abundance, except what I just said is never true. You don't measure an abundance. What you measure is the equivalent width of the spectral line. And then you have to use that equivalent width to derive the abundance. Not only that, you, it's not enough to get the column density of helium-3. You have to get its abundance relative to hydrogen. And so here is the simplest possible ansatz, a uniform isothermal ionized nebula composed solely of hydrogen and helium. And this is how you get the helium-3 to plus to hydrogen plus col uh, column density ratio. Okay, this is the simplest form. 
Moreover, um, the density and ionization structure has to be accounted for. And the problem is the helium-3 transition is collisionally excited. And so its intensity is proportional to the electron density uh, integral through the, uh, through the nebula. That's the, the uh, path through the nebula itself. Whereas we're getting the, the hydrogen column density from free-free Bremsstrahl line, which is a two-body interaction from the continuum you get, it requires an E squared DL. So the uh, density distribution matters. So this was a conundrum um, that was partially, well, so the great progress was made by Dana Balser in his thesis at Boston University, where he wrote a nebula, uh, a, a numerical code, code called nebula that allowed us to model these H2 regions in a form that isn't spherical, homogeneous, and isothermal. And of course, cloudy later on allowed us to address some of the ionization issues. So here are two models for W43 and S209. These are uh, VLA images that we took of these H2 regions. And the contours are the, are, are the components of the models in the Nebula program. Nebula uh, calculates um, the, 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 the combination line physics and produces a, 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 a spectrum that is convolved with the uh, telescope beam, in this case, to 140 foot. Now, I'm not going to go through all the panels on the bottom, but what they are are the um, figures of merit, the, what we can get out of the recombination lines to, to analyze whether or not this model has, makes any sense. So what we're plotting in each panel is the percentage deviation between the nebula model predictions um, and the actual measurements of the various recombination lines that we were measuring along the way. You can see we got up to delta N of 14 in the case of W43. And remember, we can only tune to, to four things at a time. We only we tuned for safety's sake to helium-3 twice, and then we only had two other tunings. So this took a lot of effort to get to these. So we tried uniform density, added the structure, um, on non-LTE structure, pressure broadening, things like that. So we improved our understanding of modeling of H2 regions. That allowed us to write this paper. We, I identified a subset of our sample of helium-3 H2 regions that were simple in the sense of we, we had more confidence in the models and more confidence in the abundance ratio. So what one expected naively in the, in the uh, standard models is that the parts of the galaxy with the most stars, i.e. the galactic center zone and the inner galaxy, should have more stellar processing and more helium-3 and in the outer galaxy, where there are fewer stars, there should be less helium-3 that had been exuded into the interstellar medium. So there be, should be a strong gradient across uh, the, the, the disk of the galaxy, which we did not see. It was called the helium-3 plateau. And we used this H2 region, Sharpless 209, to uh, estimate the production, um, to estimate uh, the, the primordial uh, uh, baryon to photon ratio of the galaxy and the omega baryon. And you notice that a year before um, Spurgle and WMAP, we got the same answer within the, within the errors for about $200 million less money. Um, so this aspect of helium-3 leads to what is currently a, a rather great concordance of, of, of measurements uh, of, of, of actually the light elements and the WMAP observations. And here's the helium-3 box. This is different models for the, for the baryon to photon ratio. These are different universes pre uh, predicting different primordial nucleosynthesis yields. So these lines are the, the, mod the predicted yields for that universe. So this is the end of the helium-3 experiment. The, the 140 foot was decommissioned. It rose like the phoenix from the ashes, of course. But this is a, a summation of 17 years of work. Um, a, a, 59 different H2 regions aligned in velocity and averaged. So this is a 200-day integration with uh, an RMS of 21 microkelvin. Um, and you can see that it's beginning to look like a solar spectrum in, in, in the sense that there are so many different transitions of recombination lines that allow us to, um, that, 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 that crowd the band. So the 140-foot was retired and the GBT came online. 
a clear aperture instrument. Just, it was, it, we, Rude and I thought, it's like they designed the telescope for us. And indeed, it was a remarkable improvement. Um, here is, a, here is a S209, Sharpless 209, with the 140 foot and the Mark III correlator, 33 hours of integration. Here's the GBT with the ACS, which was later just called the spectrometer, uh, with only three hours of integration. With the GBT uh, 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 ACS spectrometer, we could tune the 16 lines, usually eight tunings at two polarizations, and always eight tunings at two polarizations, 50 megahertz bandwidth and 4096 channels, not 296 channels. And these were the recombination lines that we had available, or had available, we couldn't do anything about them. They were in our spectrum. Now, the thing about using these as figures of merit is that if you can measure a recombination line at the same intensity of what you think is a helium-3 signal, then you've got evidence that your spectrometer is functioning reasonably. Why? Because we know what, in LTE anyway, what the recombination line ratio, intensity ratios you should be between the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta transitions. These recombination lines, the weak ones or all of them should not be a function of time. So at different observing epochs, we should get the same answer. So they are really very wonderful figures of merit for spectrometer performance. And, and I could go on at great length and great boring length, but I shall not. So here's S206, um, one of the H2 regions that, that we were studying because we thought it was simple, simple enough to model, we being Dana Balser and I. And, and here is the result of um, the GBT ACS spectrometer observations of S206. Now in frequency, not in channels at the bottom. And let me be very clear, those red lines are not a fit to the dotted lines, which are the data. Those red lines are the predicted spectrum from Balser's nebula modeling code. And the bottom, of course, is the residuals between the model and the nebula, uh, the model and the data. And here are same model, different recombination line transitions, H144 delta, um, H130 gamma blended with H208 nu, uh, H93 kappa, H152 epsilon, delta N is equal to four. It's a, it's, it's a remarkable um, uh, confirmation of recombination line theory and spectrometer performance. That model stems from six density components, LTE, no pressure broadening, um, a, a helium four plus to hydrogen plus intensity ratio, and that abundance of helium three. We picked one, two, three, four, five, six H2 regions whose, whose abundance ratios we thought we could model well enough, accurately enough to be confident of the error bars. We're proved, I just proved that to you for S206, which is this point here. And, and we found actually a slight gradient with these H2 regions. And we wrote a paper um, based on all of these recombination line transitions uh, that compared our results to different models for extra mixing in stars. We had proven years before that standard stellar evolution that I outlined previously wasn't true. There had to be some extra mixing process that mixed the helium-3 that, that, that had um, accumulated in the outer part of the core back into the core and into regions hot enough to destroy it. And so, um, we had spawned an entire new industry in stellar evolutionary um, modeling that had to come up with different mix, extra mixing mechanisms that Bob Rood had, had, had pointed out long ago in, in a seminal paper that uh, in our early parts of our helium-3 work. So we got a taste for recombination lines. We saw that um, Gart Westerhout started continuum surveys and recombination lines became um, something that were being surveyed by the, by the Germans, principally early at Max Planck. They were looking at continuum bumps and trying to find recombination lines. Uh, Altenhoff, also at Bonn, um, 
did an enormous amount of work making surveys of the galactic plane at various frequencies. And here's a five gigahertz map filled with contours. And Jay Lockman used to call something like this the dreaded wiggly line syndrome. But Jay, while we were doing the helium-3 experiment, we often shared the telescope with Jay. And Jay pointed the 140 foot at 462 of those continuum bumps, basically all of the continuum bumps on Al Altenhoff's map uh, in the galaxy that he could find. Basically, most of the time took one total power on-off pair and discovered 462 H2 regions. Each discovery provides a velocity. And so here's the LV map of Jay's paper. This here is an interesting region. This is SIG OB2, which has several hundred OB stars. It's a, an enormously rich region of star formation, it just sticks out of longitude velocity maps. Um, well, Jay had done this work. He caught all the low hanging fruit. The existing sensitivity of the continuum surveys gave him no further um, list of targets, and Jay moved on. But we were there with the telescope, and I, I, never, I never forgot that. So we now come to um, yet another uh, survey. Well, you people now, you youngins, are living in the great age of surveys. And one of them is the surveys done by the Spitzer Space Telescope. At Boston University, we were, we were key members of the Galactic Legacy Infrared Midplane Survey Extraordinaire, the BLIMPS project. I am personally responsible for the E. And I made Lauren Anderson, in one chapter of his dissertation at BU, uh, write a chapter uh, just in, in studying the mid-IR properties of known first quadrant galactic H2 regions using these images. And it turned out that, yes, it was a nice chapter, but he, he discovered, we discovered, that all H2 regions of first order look alike. They have 24 micron emission surrounded by a PDR. Um, and in cases where we have continuum maps, there's continuum right in the center. So what are we, what are we seeing? Why is this? All right, so here's an OB star. And as time goes on, it's strong red zone. It's spherical ionized plasma surrounding it. Gets bigger and bigger until finally there's an equilibrium state. And you end up with um, a PDR surrounding this OB star with radio continuum. So if you see something that looks like this, and here are a bunch of images, not, uh, not now from Spitzer, but from the WISE satellite, uh, uh, Lauren and his team went and, and laboriously scanned the uh, entire galactic plane around the entire sky from the WISE satellite and, and found uh, made a list of H2 region candidates. And you can see that you know a lot of them look exactly like we just described. These are targets. Lots of those H2 regions that looked like this in his thesis were not known to be H2 regions, hundreds of them actually. And so we had a target list. And here is the original team of the eight GBT H2 region discovery survey, normalized to age 30. Now, in X-band, um, the, uh, the ACS receiver um, was capable of tuning simultaneously to alpha transitions from H86 alpha to H93 alpha. H86 is compromised by H108 beta, so, so we had to not use it. But they're very close together in end level. And if all you want to do is make a discovery, they have to first order the same intensity so you can average them together. So we did when we were searching these targets. Typically one off, off pair gave us uh, um, two millikelvin RMS and we discovered that 95% of our targets showed radio recombination line emission. Here are some, some examples of things. The green is continuum, the, the image is 24 microns, and here are the spectra. We can 
from the velocities determine their kinematic distances, and we get things as far as 19.2 kiloparsecs away. Some of them are unambiguous. Here's a G32.9, galactic longitude 32.9, with a negative velocity. It has to be in the outer galaxy at a distance of 16 kiloparsecs. So this is just a few examples. It's like someone showing pictures of their children, so I will stop. Well, we spent years looking at every candidate that we could uh, from the northern sky with the GBT. Um, yes, there's, there's others that, that we could probably go after, um, because, but the integration time would be prohibitively expensive. You know, spending half an hour for one target just wasn't worth it. So there was the unplumbed southern sky. After all, the wise catalog of galactic H2 regions spans the entire sky and the galaxy isn't going to, um, is, is it, we, of course you want to go to the southern sky. And so um, we put together a team, um, pretty small by current standards for, for large surveys uh, and produced the southern H2 region discovery survey using uh, the ATCA interferometer and it's wonderful CAD back end uh, and the, the back end and, and the receiver allows us to tune between four to 10 gigahertz. We also got continuum at 16 gigahertz in that zone. We were able to use 18 of the alpha recombination line transitions so we could stack them together. And at the end of the day, we detected 730 new H2 regions. And the, this formed part, only part of Trey Winger's thesis dissertation at University of Virginia. And it would never have happened the SHRBS without Trey. Here is a continuum image of one of our sources, G309. I left out the rest of the position. Here is uh, the average spectrum on the right. Here is uh, this, uh, the, all the recombination lines that we stacked together. So you could see um, that uh, things are copacetic. So here it is. Here is the current census of galactic H2 regions after the work of many, many, many decades. 2,376 nebulae. You can see that we have more than doubled the number of known H2 regions. Um, previously known or black dots, you can hardly see them. Um, HRDS, magenta triangles, and green squares for the SHRDS. Lots of, lots of interesting structure. This is the data. This is the unprocessed galactic structure in this map. Um, and this zone is really empty. The galaxy is not symmetric in the, in the, in the uh, distribution of sites of current formation of massive stars. All of this is uh, available to you, the community, uh, at a website that Lauren Anderson crafted and maintains. Um, it it uh, covers the entire sky. It's a nice tool. I chose not to try to get to it and, and play with it for you, but play with it. Um, you can zoom in, you could click on any given, um, uh, that's the infrared image in the back, the wise image in the back, 22 microns, as I recall. And every single uh, H2 region in his catalog is listed here and information about whether or not it has been detected and other properties of the detections. It's a, it's a wonderful database, enjoy. So now that we have the census, we're, we're beginning to mine the fruits of our labors. One of the things that we look at is, um, is the metallicity distribution in the galaxy. Now, how can we do that with recombination lines? Well, the first hint of this came out of the Bond group in the early days, 1975, where Ed Churchill and Malcolm Wamsley um, published a paper, Are Electron Temperatures of H2 Regions a Function of Galactic Radius? This is their plot. Um, they were right, but seriously, it was, a, it was a bit of a reach as far as I was concerned. Um, uh, many years later um, in 2006, with our, our 140 foot work, we, we had something that looked a bit better. Um, well, actually it looks a lot better, but there's still, still a lot of scatter and there were a few problems here. Now, how do you get the electron temperature? You, it turns out, if you read Mark Gordon's book, he'll tell you all the details. 
Um, if you measure the line to continuum ratio, recombination line, line intensity divided by the continuum uh, at that frequency, uh, that turns out to be a, a function of electron temperature to, uh, to really, good, uh, really good approximation. So you can derive from line to continuum measurements the electron temperature. Pa parenthetically, Jay never me me measured the continuum when he started all of this. Um, he was, uh, he, he, he was uh, not interested in, in, that, in TE at the time. He was interested in finding H2 regions. That was a proper approach, I think. Well, it turned out a few years later, Shaver and a, and a team uh, correlated um, electron temperature uh, measurements um, with optical measurements of the O to H abundance and provided a calibration of TE with metallicity if you're using O to H as, as, as a tracer of uh, metallicity. That is to say, the electron temperature of an H2 region is a proxy for source metallicity. So various papers were, were, were written about this, but the, the, the most recent one was um, uh, uh, the list of authors up here, uh, Dana and, and Trey went through our various H2 regions and, and, and they found a sample of, of robust line to continuum measurements. And so here is their TE plot for that sample. Um, and there's the solution of it. And then if you apply the Shaver calibration, you can see that there's a metallicity gradient here. So what's going on? Why is there a TE gradient? Well, the temperature of the plasma is a balance between heating and cooling. Heating is, of course, the coming from the, uh, the ionization from the stellar flux, but the cooling is is used to, is mostly is dominated by fine structure transitions of metals. And so the, the more metals there are, the cooler the gas. Now, where in the galaxy would you expect there to be more metals? In the inner galaxy, where there are more stars dying and producing and enriching, dying and, 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 and ejecting material and steadily enriching the metallicity of the gas. So you'd expect higher metals in the galactic center and lower metals in the galactic outskirts. Well, that being said, the galaxy turns out not to be radially symmetric. Here's a face on view of the Milky Way. There's the sun, there's the galactic center, there's the long and short bars. And here is the, the dots of the sample of the, of the nebulae uh, that, that were used. And, and the contour map is, is a fancy way of interpolating those dots uh, to turn it into a contour map. And you can see local zones of metal enhancement and, uh, and metal um, uh, um, girth, as it were. So the galaxy has azimuthal structure in metallicity, which is unexpected because due to differential rotation, you would expect it to be well mixed. You would expect it to look pretty much as mutually symmetric. So that's a result that we're still pondering over uh, and pursuing. Another um, paper, another result is uh, our discovery um, in the Southern Hemisphere, SHRDS originally, but now elsewhere, of a, of a sample of H2 regions that have a strong velocity gradient. So here's a wise image. Um, and the black contours are the continuum. And the curves are curves of uh, constant velocity, where green is the, is the uh, line, uh, spectral line, the recombination line velocity at the centroid of, of, of the emission. And then as you go across, uh, the peak velocity changes off of this. This could be an outflow. Uh, this could be a couple of other things that, that we are exploring. We also uh, ex uh, explored um, the, uh, from the, our sample, the luminosity function of the sample of H2 regions. Um, again, there's too much here to, to, to sample, but too much here to talk about, but nearly 800 regions uh, were used. Um, and it was a tricky st uh, statistical analysis. Um, we, the, the knee here, it represents our completeness limit where we just don't get anything. Um, it's too faint, but because other people have seen single and double power laws in external galaxies in terms of the luminosity uh, distribution of H2 regions, we tried to, tried to distinguish for our own Milky Way between the two, and it sort of came out as a tie. Um, it was a, an odd, interesting result, I guess, but you'd always wish you'd have a definitive answer to that. Okay.
So all these data from the GBT stem from the GBT plus the ACS. But what about Vegas? I mean, the light motif here, the, the, the wonderfulness of the Green Bank Observatory is the ever increasing um, power of the spectrometer, the telescope plus the back end. We've gone from 256 channels for tuning to Vegas where we can do um, 64 at two polarizations, 64 tunings. Here's how, what it can do nowadays. The top is, uh, is W3, uh, one 12 minutes, six minute on, six minute off observation with all the alpha lines in the X band receiver um, band. Oh, no, no, this is just H91 alpha. This is just one of them, 12 minutes. The bottom is the uh, same thing, except 27 hours-ish, with this being a zoom where we can see H91 alpha. The helium line shifted due to the ma different mass of the nucleus. Here's carbon. So we've written papers on the helium to hydrogen uh, ratio, Y plus. Um, we've written papers on the carbon line, which comes from the PDR principally. And here's one H154 epsilon. I'm finishing early. Didn't uh, didn't time this well. I talk too fast sometimes. Here is uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about today, and it's the GBT diffuse ionized gas survey. Uh, the uh, spearheaded by Aunt Lauren and and his idea. This uh, this mapped um, the recombination lines in a substantial zone of the inner galaxy near the galactic plane, included the galactic center. Mapped is important. Everything that I've been talking about thus far were targeted observations. They were very efficient. We knew what the targets were. They, they, were, they had the infrared morphology and continuum match um, that told us that they almost undoubtedly had to be H2 regions. The HRDS had a 95% detection rate. The SHRDS had, I think, 93, I forget. Um, if uh, if uh, uh, Trey is on, he can correct me later. But I mean, four to eight gigahertz. This is still the old X band receiver, by the way. It's being replaced. 64 tunings, two polarizations, 50 megahertz, 4096 channels. Not all the tunings are usable. Sometimes there's weird uh, IF structure in the IF. Sometimes the system temperatures at the extreme uh, uh, frequencies at each end have bad system temperatures. In the end, Simultaneously, we could get 15 alpha transitions, 18 beta transitions, eight gamma transitions, and six molecules. Just a torrent, just a torrent of data. Enormous, enormous progress in one person's lifetime. So I leave you to think about this. Here are two lines of sight we chose um, to focus on because they had nothing interesting about them. They had no radio continuum. They had no obvious mid-IR emission. They were empty. And th these are 700 hour integrations towards galactic longitude, 20 degrees, latitude zero, 45 degrees, latitude zero, 15 stack alpha transitions. And this really is diffuse ionized gas. Those are antenna temperatures in millikelvin. Uh, there's no H2 region in, the, in these directions. And we're pondering what this all means as we speak. So Green Bank is a wonderful place. I've enjoyed every second that I've been there. I, I have stories to tell, which I cannot, because those individuals have stories to tell about me as well. So I thank you for your attention. And, and if Jay Lockman is here, this is for you, Jay. Oh my goodness, it's quite funny. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tom. We'll give you um, virtual, virtual applause. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we'll take questions. Uh, if you haven't, please fill, fill out the poll and I'll share it with you all. But in the meantime, uh, either uh, raise your hand to ask a question uh, or put it in the chat and I'll read it out loud. 
Okay, we have a few coming in here. Um, okay, uh, so I'll go with the typed one first and then I'll go with the ones that have their raised hands. So uh, Jim Jackson would like to know if you could have any new capability on the GBT, what would you need to extend this kind of work? Oh, I, can, I don't get to make the aperture bigger, JJ. Not sure we, about this. <laughs> the, the problem, the problem, the problem is, I, I think we, we've, we've, as Jay did originally, we, we've, we've gotten to the limit of, of the, the continuum of targets. We have more targets, but there are things without any continuum. We either need better continuum surveys or, or, uh, better receivers. But you know, we're down at twenty five k. The the point is, is that we have targets, but, but it would take half an hour per target and. Given all the other wonderful science on the GBT, I don't think we fare very well with that kind of proposal. Okay. Uh, Jay has a question. Should be able to talk, Jay, I think. Got it there. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, Tom, I commend you for your photoshopping abilities. <laughs> the um, two things, uh, one, maybe to answer. Jim's question, or phrase it a different way. How about more pixels? Well, it, it, okay, depends on what you're looking for, right? Um, if you're just looking for detections uh, to 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 make the census bigger for further for further uh, um, increasing the census, uh, more pixels don't help. But if you really want to study things like the velocity gradient, sure. I mean, arrays, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But uh, but my original question was, um, on one of your final slides, you said you had detected six molecules. And it seems to me no, that- No, 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 no. I said we had tuned to six molecules. Tuned to? Yes. Well, that, that but what I'm we thinking- have, we, have, we, can, we can tune to 64 frequencies. And so we, we ran out of recombination lines. And so we added molecules. We, we haven't looked hard at those molecular spectra yet. Oh, okay. What I was going to say was, what you've got also is a really interesting uh, sample of the chemistry in these lines of sight, and especially where the continuum is low. Um, in any case, you're looking through the entire Milky Way, and where the continuum is low, you would have a very sensitive uh, measure of potential chemical species, um, you, know, you know, a survey of them in the galaxy. Huh. I'm not sure we have the sensitivity. I, if Lauren's on, um, Lauren has has looked at at there's 64 tunings. There's a lot to look at, and Lauren's looked at more of them than I. Um, so maybe he would uh, maybe he would like to um, chime in on that, Jay. Okay, somebody thanks. Asked, somebody asked me that question. Great. Uh, so I have two more for you about uh, capabilities, but we'll ask. Uh, so. Uh, Mark wants to know, uh, would the Milky Way's bar structure account for the azimuthal asymmetry in metallicity? That's a good idea. Uh, we It might, um, but I don't know how bars would... Well, every time I think of bars, I think of uh, NGC 1300, <laughs> which has, at the end of its bars, just an enormous, an enormous um, glob of H2 region production. Um, and uh, we, uh, we have many things to look at, and that's an idea that we have not pursued in detail as yet, but it is certainly a good idea. Great. Uh, so Jim Jackson is coming back about the his question about uh, what kind of capabilities would you like on the GBT, and he's wondering, would an expanded bandwidth back end help with sure. any of your endeavors. Make, make, make the receiver's uh, instantaneous bandwidth wider and, and make the correlator's bandwidth uh, appropriate. The, the, cab, uh, the cab approach is, is a pretty good one where you can, uh, you can sample the, the instantaneous bandwidth of, 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 the, of the IF. Of course, your IF limited at some point, right? Forget what the IF bandwidth is, limit is. Hmm. D, D2, uh, no, it, it, we've, we've looked, um, but the, the deuterium line um, is 10 to the five down. It's, it's just too, too, too sensitive, too, too weak for us to ever find it. 
Okay. So uh, someone wanted to know uh, if you could use the new ultra wideband receiver to get more radio recombination lines. Uh, I don't know enough about that receiver. Um, so I don't, I don't have any sensible thing to say to that. Thank you. Uh, okay. And I think the other two are uh, just comments. So do we have uh, any other questions for Tom? Well, at the end, I would like to hear the story that you uh, alluded to in your presentation, but uh, I, I will say thank you very much, Tom, for sharing with us this, and thanks to everyone attending. Uh, next week, we will have our last talk, and uh, thank you all for joining.